All right. Good morning. Welcome, artists. Welcome to Art Adventures Live. I am Mr. Andy, the studio programs manager here at Jaws and Art Museum, which means I get to make art with people like you that come and visit our museum uh, all throughout the year. Art Adventures is a drop-in experience that is free for museum members that happens every Friday morning when the museum is open, with, normally with our friend Miss Therese, who may be watching from home. In this time of COVID, we are all doing what we can to keep each other safe by staying at home. So I will bring Art Adventures to you each week so we can make art together from the comfort of your home. For a full list of upcoming brand new July Art Adventures and weekly, and weekly material lists, please visit jawson.org. If you do not have materials ready right now, a recording of today's video will be posted along with a Pinterest board, board about today's artist so that you can watch and make art when you have time. Each week, we will be inspired by a different artist or artwork from Jocelyn's galleries and create our own masterpiece while learning how these artworks were made and what makes them special. In today's art adventure, we will be inspire, inspired to create a powerful portrait like this huge painting in Jocelyn's galleries by Micheline Thomas. And here's a picture of our friend Micheline Thomas. A portrait painting is a painting of a person, often from the shoulder up to the top of their head. Most portraits show us a picture of someone that the artist thinks is important for us to see. This person demands our attention. We want to know more about this person. We aspire to be like this person. This person must have high worth and esteem. And esteem. For hundreds of years, throughout all art history, especially Western art history, portrait painting was made to show us pictures of the rich and the powerful. Sometimes these wealthy pictures were made because the person in the portrait paid the artist, and maybe even at, made, at, uh, paid the artist, to make them appear more powerful, strong, or confident than they may have actually been in real life. Historically, marginalized people, like African Americans and black people around the world, were not often represented as the primary focus of a work of art. They were too often off to the side or shown as something exotic or different. Not until the last half of this, half of this, half of this the last half century, or even more accurately probably, the last several decades, has art made by black artists or depicting black faces been viewed with the same merit as white artists. For most of art history, artworks by black artists have been viewed as something separate or even outside the timeline of Western art. Artworks showing the black experience have not been included with the museums in the same way or with the same frequency as white artists. Micheline Thomas often paints pictures of black women in powerful poses. Sometimes she so shows us all of a figure from the bottom of their toes to the top of their head, like this beautiful picture, portrait, figure portrait of her mother. This is a picture of Micheline's mom. Many of the people Micheline chooses to paint are people that are important to, in her life, like her mom and her friends. Many people she chooses to paint feel important when they pose for Micheline's paintings and see themselves within a work of art. Her figures are posed with dignity and power and control. Often I feel as though when I look at these portraits, it's not as if I'm looking at them, it's like they're looking at me, staring right at me. Many times Micheline's portraits and figures are surrounded by pattern. Sometimes they are surrounded by a single repeated pattern, like wallpaper, like in this picture, we can see the pattern repeats, sim the simple pattern repeats all around the, this portrait. Bringing, uh, bringing the subject to focus, front and center. This beautiful portrait is full of simple pattern and this, this, the portrait from the shoulder to the top of the head fills almost the entire picture. Other times, other times the people in Micheline's paintings are surrounded by lots of different pattern, painted to look like bits of cut fabric or collage materials. 
So we could, here we can see lots of different patterns. Some of it looks like animals and stripes and checks and flowers. Micheline Thomas loves to embellish her backgrounds and even the facial features in her portraits, the hair, the lips, the eyes, or maybe the clothing. Making, uh, she'll, she'll embellish these parts of her portraits with costume jewelry or other glittery materials that she carefully uh, glues or adheres to the surface of her painting, like this portrait of Oprah. When you see this portrait in real life, it glitters it glitters and reflects light to make the, the portrait, to fill the portrait with reflected light and glamour. Micheline Thomas often references well-known artworks through the poses of her models or the titles of her paintings. She'll make connections to well-known wor works of art found in art history books used in schools all around the world. She paints, she paints black faces and bodies into the timeline of human creativity, which reminds me that even though black people all around the world, like all people, have been have been making work, making art to express themselves forever and ever. These artists are not as well known as those artists I learned about in school. The title of the portrait in Jocelyn's galleries is Din une très belle négresse. This is a, is a French title, so I hope I pronounced it well enough. This is a reference, this French title is a reference to a note written by a famous French painter named Edouard Manet. Manet and other artists in the late 1900s, so more than 100 years ago, began to paint portraits of everyday people. Pictures of their neighbors and people who worked hard jobs. So not just the rich and powerful. In a book that Micheline read about a note that Manet, Manet had written, to uh, written, he wrote read a note next to the contact information and the address for uh, for a model that lived near him, just around the corner. A model named Lore would pose for him frequently. And this note next to the this note, Untre Bel Negres, written next to her address and contact information, translates to a beautiful black woman. Lore, who posed for for Manet several times can be seen in nearly every art history book ever made. But often, she's regarded as only a background character. This is a picture that we see again and again in art history books of lore. Micheline Thomas, the title of Micheline Thomas's portrait, Den Untre Mel, in, Untre, Bell Negles translates to Din. That's the name of this person, Din, D I N. Din, a beautiful black woman. Like Lore, over a hundred years ago, Micheline is showing us that her friend Din is a beautiful black woman. This time, the beautiful black woman is the absolute most important thing in the picture. She takes over nearly everything else that is happening around her. Micheline brings her model to the very front, taking up nearly an entire frame with a flattened pattern, background, peeking out behind the shape of her natural hair and her confident gaze. Portrait paintings like the picture of Din do not only show us where black figures and faces were missing or misrepresented in the history of art, but continue the tradition of portrait painting and push it to, to, to new limits, giving us new ideas offering, and offering greater opportunities for museum visitors to identify with an artistic representation that reflects their own experience or allows others to interact with the creative expression generated from an experience that may be different than their own. Just as Micheline Thomas uses portraiture in her, in her visual voice as an African-American to continue to push the tradition of portraiture, other African-American artists in Jocelyn's galleries contribute to the history of art through other mediums like this minimalist sculpture by Martin Purier. Purvis Young paints what he sees using expressionistic symbolism. Kara Walker creates beautifully composed satiric narratives. Rashid Johnson 
expresses himself through multimedia conceptualism and many others. But today we're going to take our inspiration from Micheline Thomas to create a powerful portrait of our own. Create a portrait uh, similar to, we're going to make a portrait. You can decide who your subject will be. But we want our portrait, we're going to create powerful portraits just like this picture here of Micheline Thomas's friend, Den. So you might choose to create today, together with me, you might choose to create a self-portrait, a picture of yourself. Like I did this here. This kind of looks a little familiar, maybe. Or you might choose to find a model. Maybe find a brother or a sister. Maybe find an adult in your home and ask if they can sit and pose for you, just as Micheline Thomas asks her family and friends to pose for her. So think about uh, who the subject of your portrait will be, if it will be you for a self-portrait or someone uh, special to you. And let's take a look at our today's supplies. So today, if you remember, uh, if you need supplies, those of you that need supplies to, to follow along with us at each week for Art Adventures, you can stop by the museum every Thursday, all day long, and, and out front of our atrium entrance, you'll find, find supply bags for everything that you need for our July Art Adventures. And this is Art Adventure, our July Art Adventures number one. So let's see what supplies we need for today. And, you, and here you'll find a list for all the adventures in July. And today for our power portraits, we need, in your bag, you'll have a piece, a heavy piece of paper that's already printed with a pattern. If you don't have a piece of paper that's printed with a pattern, we can draw our own pattern. Or maybe you can find wallpaper, or, or you can create a collage with your portrait. But uh, grab your piece of paper with a pattern. Let's set that to the side. And then we'll need one piece of paper to create our portrait. And what we'll do together today is we're going to We'll take our pattern paper, and we'll fill it with color, and then we'll create a port. You'll, then you'll create your portrait, and we'll cut and paste that portrait right on top of that pattern. We're going to make our portraits big to fill up, so we're right in the front, just like Dan and Nicolene Thomas's picture. So we'll need our pattern paper. We'll need a piece and a piece of uh, paper to create our portrait. We'll need some watercolor paints. So you can choose to paint when we begin to create our skin tones. We'll need a pair, pair of scissors. We'll need a glue stick to adhere your portrait to your pattern paper. Or maybe you might even have glitter or gems like Micheline Thomas does it, uh, uses in her work. A white crayon we don't need, actually. What we do need is a black crayon. So that's what we'll need. Let's double check. We'll, each of, we'll need a, a black crayon to draw with. We'll need watercolors or crayons or colored pencils or markers, anything to add color to your portrait and your patterns. We'll need a piece of, we'll need some scissors to cut out your portrait and glue to glue your portrait onto your pattern paper. And we'll need a cup of water, a cup of water to paint with. Since I will be painting today, if you're not painting, you don't need a cup of water. But uh, let's begin. Let's begin. Let's talk first about your pattern paper. So. In my example that I made for us today, I use crayons to fill in my pattern paper. So you can use color pencils or markers or your watercolor paints to fill in that, that all the, the, the pattern with color. Maybe colors that repeat over and over and over again to, um, to in our background. Now this takes a little bit of time. So that might be something you do when you're finished with me today. You can fill in your background paper with, with pattern. And if you don't have pattern, a pre-printed pattern paper, or even if you might choose, maybe you're not as maybe you're not fond of that pattern that we've provided you, you can always freestyle your pattern. Instead of maybe you want to create a pattern of your very own. You can using crayons, I might draw some big shapes to create maybe power, patterns like flowers, but you could maybe have flower a pattern with maybe, I don't know, bumblebees. Maybe, you're, uh, maybe your pattern repeats with cherries. A pattern is anything that repeats over and over again. So you could draw a pattern of your very own. Maybe it's patterns like some of those we saw in the examples that we look like, looked at by Micheline Thomas, of lines that crisscrossed 
and then we can use our color pencils, markers, or watercolor paints to add color to each of those patterns. So you can choose to create your pattern or to fill your pattern, your provided pattern, in with color after we talk a bit about portraits. Because let's, I want to take some time together to make a portrait with you together. With us together, we're going to make a portrait. And portraits, we're going to make a portrait. We want to make a portrait that, that looks like, like our subject. We want people to look at our portrait and they want them to recognize that person. We want them to look at that person and know that they are important, that they are powerful, that they are confident. And they want, we want them to know what that person looks like. So it's important that when you make a portrait and you want your portrait to look like a person, that you look at that person. So it's important that if you are drawing yourself, see, grab a mirror. Ask an adult or look around your house or maybe even uh, later on today you can draw in the bathroom and look right, look right at yourself in the mirror. I even have a mirror attached to my easel here to help me look at myself. If you're drawing a, a, a family member or a friend, be sure that you look closely at them as you draw them. It's important. And we're going to go step by step. It's, it's important to look at them as we go step by step and draw each of our facial features. So together, you and I, are going to put our face together. Our faces are made of different parts, different features. And we're going to go step by step adding one facial feature at a time. So we're going to, make, we're going to start with the shape of our head. And then we'll add our eyes, then our nose, then your mouth, your ears, and you people can add some hair. So let's begin. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Or look at a person that's near you or look at my head. When you look at my head, where you look at your head in the mirror, what shape is your head? Is your shape perfectly round? Is the shape of your head perfectly round like a soccer ball? Not quite, right? Not quite. When you look at your head, your head is stretched out. And all, and all of our faces are different. So it's important to look in the mirror and draw the face that you see. Or look at your, your model and draw the face that you see. But our heads, when I look in the mirror, my head, my head's more round than your head, probably. My head is a shape kind of like this. Now, remember when we, when we, if you made art with me before, you know that when we begin to draw on our paper, we like to sketch, which means I'm going to draw softly. It might be even hard for you to see. Draw softly, sketch with loose lines to figure out. These are my practice lines to figure out where everything's going to go. And then once I know what I want to keep, I'm going to come back in and push hard with my crayon my black crayon, to make all of my keeper lines extra black. So my head's maybe a little something more like this, almost like an egg that's turned up on its point. And look how big I drew my head. I challenge you, if you drew your head kind of small, if you sketched it kind of small, sketch it big. Go make it really big. We want our portraits to be super big. Almost the whole piece of paper. So that's the shape of our head. And we're not going to draw any hair yet, or any eyes, or nose. Stay with me. Let's go step by step. Now, right here, the, the number one rule to remember when you're drawing portraits is to chop it in half. All right? Remember that. We're going to say it a lot. Chop it in half. So every time we go to add a new facial feature, we're going to chop it in half. That means I'm going to chop my, my, the shape of my head right in half. Believe it or not, your eyeballs are right in the middle of your head, or close to the middle of your head. Take your hand, if you will, at home with me. Take your hand, put it on the top of your head. Put another hand on the bottom of your head. Bring them together slowly. When they meet, they should meet right about in the middle of your head. It's easy to see with me, because I don't have hair covering the top of my head. So you can see that my eyes are right in the middle. So we need to make your eyes are right in the middle, too. It's just most of your head's covered up with hair. So we're going to create a guideline. And I'm going to use, I'm going to use a, I'm going to use a red color pencil so you can see my guideline, or my red crayon. But you might just take your black crayon and very softly, like a feather, draw a horizontal line, a line that goes from the left to the right, right through the middle of your head. Super soft. I'm going to make mine with red so you can see it. See my red guideline? That's right where your eyes are going to go. Now take a look in the mirror, or look at your model, and look at their eyes. All of our eyes are different. Some of you have wide eyes, some of your eyes might be further apart, some of your eyes are closer together, some of your eyelids might be heavy, some of your eyes might be open and wide. But we all, our eyes are all made up of the same parts. 
and they're made up of a, an eyelid on top and an eyelid on the bottom. So we're going to start by drawing the eyelid on the top and the eyelid on the, on the bottom. When you look in the mirror, our eyes don't look like two little buttons, just like that. Instead, our eyes are made up of lots of different parts. Eyelids, eyelashes, eyebrows, tear ducts, iris, lots of different parts. We're going to try to draw lots of those parts. So I'm going to look in the mirror. And my eyes, the top of my eyes, are curved like this, little rainbows. So start by drawing the, start by drawing the top of your eyelid, your top eyelid, like little rainbows. And there's usually enough space, if you look in, your eye, in the mirror again, there's usually enough space for a third eye. If you had a three eyes, there'd be enough space right between your two eyeballs for a third eye. So look to see how close your eyes are and try to leave enough space for a third eyeball that would be right there in the middle. Then look in the mirror and look at your bottom eyelid. Look at the line where your eyelid touches your eye, the white part of your eye. It curls up like this. So our eyes start to look like little almonds or footballs. Some of them are, some of them are wide and some of them are more narrow. Look to see what kind of eye, how your eyelid, how, what the shape of your eyes. Now, we need to draw. We want, to, we want our picture to look accurate, almost like a photograph or like a scientist. We're going to look at our eyeballs like a scientist. If you look at your eye, look at your eyeball. So your eyelids keep your eyeball from falling out of your head. And your eyeball is called a ball because it's round, right? And so we, we can only see the, the left side and the right side of our eyelid, of our eyeball. So I'm going to put little curved lines right over here. If you look right where you're towards the corner of your eye, you can see how that your eye, the white part of your eyeball is curved. It's a vertical curved line. Just a little curved line. And over here are where your tears are made, your tear ducts. Then we have uh, the colored part of your eye. The colored part of your eye is called your iris. Take a look in the mirror and see, uh, look at your iris. Your iris, the colored part of your eye, is a perfect circle. If you open your eyes wide, you might even see all of your iris. It's a perfectly round circle. But when your eyes, when you relax your eyes, or even if you give, your, give, a, give a little bit of attitude with your eyebrows, lots of your iris will be covered, especially the top part. So I'm going to make a big round circle, but the top part of that circle might be chopped off a bit by the top part of my eye lid. Then look in the mirror and look at your pupil. If you're looking straight ahead, your pupil is looking, it's going to be right in the middle. And uh, your pupil is where light enters your eyeball, so you can see things. So that's actually a black hole. It's a hole right in your eye that changes size. When there's lots of light, your, eye, your pupil will get small. When there's less light, the lights are off, your pupils will get big so you can see everything more clearly. Now, let's keep going. Let's add, now we need our eyelashes. We all have eyelashes to keep things, debris out of our eyes. And those eyelashes are attached to our upper and lower eyelid. Our upper eyelid, when we open your eyes, it's kind of like, like the top of a convertible. It comes back and it hangs out in the back of the car. Our top of our eyelid hangs out above our eye. So we need a lid, we need a a line right above our eye. That's where our convertible top, our eyelid is hanging out. And then look in the mirror and look at your eyelashes. I know I have beautiful eyelashes. Maybe you have beautiful eyelashes too. And draw some eyelashes. You don't need to draw every eyelash, but look at your eyelashes and put in some eyelashes. And even look at the bottom. You have eyelashes down there too. Maybe an eyelash or two on the bottom. Now very important are your eyebrows. Our eyebrows give us a lot of personality. Our eyes are all different. You have different colored eyes, you have different shaped eyes, but our eyebrows are very different. And your eyebrows move up and down and they can help tell people how you're feeling or what you're thinking. And so give yourself, look in the mirror and look at your eyebrows. Lots of time I'll have one eyebrow that goes up. And you people probably don't have a lot of these, but I have a few wrinkles. But I like to draw my eyebrows by drawing the shape of my eyebrow. Not only to draw every little hair, but draw the shape of your eyebrow. Some of you might have thick eyebrows. Some of you might have very thin eyebrows. Some of you might have blonde eyebrows. Some of you might have eyebrows that are closer together. Draw the shape of your eyebrows and then give your eyebrows some texture. Because our eyebrows are 
made up of tiny little hairs that keep sweat and things from getting down into our eyeballs. So our eyeball, look, our eyes are made up of lots of different parts, not just little buttons in, uh, in lines for eyebrows, but instead we have shapes for eyebrows filled with texture. This my, those are my wrinkles. You probably don't have wrinkles out there. And then our eyelid, our, eye, our eyeball, our iris, and our pupil. I think we're ready now for another facial feature. Now remember when we, when, we, when we put our eyeballs on, we had to chop the shape of our head in half. So when, next, when, we, when we need, now we, remember, all we need to do is remember to chop it in half. We just keep chopping it in half. We're gonna put our nose down here, right in the middle from our eyes to your chin. Your nose is right in the middle of your eyes and your chin. If you put your hand right on your eyes and the bottom of your chin, bringing them together, the bottom of your nose is right in the middle of this space. So you can take your black crayon and very softly chop that in half. Create a guideline. I'm going to make this one blue. I'm going to chop that in half. We're going to put our nose right there in the, in the middle, right in the middle between our eyes and the bottom of our chin. Now all of our noses are different, but they're all made of the same parts. We have a bridge of our nose. That, uh, this part that brings from the tip of our nose, it comes up all the way to our eyebrows, our bridge of our nose. You have the ball of your nose, that's at the tip of your nose. And you have two nostrils, that's where you keep your boogers. And when you look at all of these, we put all these parts together to make the nose that looks like your nose, or the subject or your, of your, or your model's nose. When you look in the mirror, your nose does not look just like that a simple cartoon nose. Instead, it's made up of lots of parts. So let's talk about how to draw those parts. Look in the mirror. All of our noses are kind of different. Mine's a little big and round. But I'm going to start with the ball of your nose. And watch me. I like to draw, I look at the ball of my nose, the tip, which is going to be right in the middle, right in the middle of my eyes, down here on my blue line. And the ball of our nose is kind of fun to draw. It's like a little tiny smiley face. Put a little tiny smiley, smiley face in there. Look at your mirror and decide how big the ball your smiley face needs to be. And then we'll put some nostrils on the left side, like the letter C. And then nostrils on the right side, like, the, like a backward C. And the little holes down here, that's where the boogers are. You don't need to draw your boogers, but put your little your nostrils down there. Those are the holes on the, under, on the underside of your nose. And then our bridge. Our bridge of our nose is a line that comes up the side of our nose, something like that. Now, you might draw a line on both sides of your bridge, but sometimes when we do that, we start to look like Mr. Potato Head. So sometimes I'll just put one line, maybe just another line or two on the other side, something like that. But look at your nose. My nose is different than your nose, so draw your nose, or draw this, the nose of your model. But we all have the same parts. Our noses are made up of the same parts. The ball of our nose, our nostrils, in the bridge. And now we're ready for another face, another facial feature. Our mouth, so our person can smile and sing. And what do we need to do? Just like before when we added our eyes and our nose, we're going to chop it in half. So grab your black crayon and we're going to chop the space from our nose and our chin, chop it in half. Your mouth is right about in the middle of our nose and our chin. So draw a, a very soft guide line. I'm going to make this one green. Just like that. And just like our eyes, our nose, and the rest of our bodies, we are all different, but we're made of the same parts. So look at your mouth. Our mouth is made up, and we're just, right, you, uh, we're, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna draw our mouths closed, similar to Den in this picture here. But our mouths are made up of a, an upper lip or a bottom lip. You can decide if you wanna put glitter on your lips, like the portrait of Den. And when I look in the mirror, I see that I have a, a, a bottom lip and, a, and a, an upper lip. Our mouth is not just a cartoon mouth like that. Instead, we have a bottom lip, which kind of looks almost like a pillow, and the top lip, which sometimes looks to me like a roller coaster. And I'll show you what I mean. Our bottom lip is kind of like a pillow. So I often, I'll look in the mirror, and you draw your bottom lip, but it's soft, like a pillow. And again, I like to sketch it out, and our lips, should be usually they're about as wide as the center of your eye. If you take a, your fingers carefully, don't poke your eyes, and bring them down from the center of your eye 
that'll line up with about the edge of your lips. But our mouths are all different. So take a look to see. You might see where your mouth lines up with your eye or your nose. Decide how big to make that bottom pillow. And the top of the pillow is gonna touch my green guideline, like that pillow. Then my top lip is kind of like a roller coaster or it's stretched out letter M. It goes up, it goes up and down a bit and down again. Look to see how your lip, how high your roller coaster goes up. Mine, co mine goes up gradually a bit like that and then down a little bit and then down like that. But all of our lips are different. So look to see how your lip, look at the shapes and the lines that you see in your lip and carefully draw that onto your face. All right, this face is starting to come together, but this face can't hear us very well, so we're gonna draw some ears. Take a look in, the, look, at your, look in the mirror, look at your ears. Our ears don't necessarily stick out like little teacup handles like that. Instead, our ears, again, they're all different. Some ears stick out, some ears are close to there, some ears are attached to the bottom, some ears are detached. Look to see the shape of your ears and look straight, at, straight, straight ahead in the mirror. And, we're just going to draw the parts of the ear that you can see, right? We can only draw what we can see. And some of your ears, since some of you have hair out there, and some of your ears might be covered by hair. You might not even need to draw the parts of your ears. But I can see all of my ears, and they kind of come in, like almost like a little cur curvy line like that. And then if I can even, maybe sometimes I can see the inside workings of my ear, my ear canal where the sound enters my, my head. I can hear people, what they're saying, things like that. But your ear starts, I forgot to mention that, your ear starts at the top, you, mostly, most of your ears, will start at the, our, our eye line, the red line for my eye, and end down here by your nose. You can take a look at that. Put your finger on the bottom of your ear, slowly bring it around to the front of your face, lines up right here about the bottom of your nose. Top of your ear. Bring it around the top of your face, right about the top of your eye, up here towards the top of your eye. And so I made these curvy shapes for my ears that kind of stick in like that. I kind of have tiny ears. Some people have bigger ears than me. All right, now uh, we said a portrait is often from the shoulder up. So we need, we don't want to just have a floating head. Let's give this person a neck and some shoulders. But look in the mirror, take a look at your neck, maybe even touch the sides of your neck and feel your neck attaches back here behind your ear and comes, you draw a line down the side of your neck, it kind of narrows in and then starts to come out again where it connects to your shoulder. Our necks do not just look like little popsicle sticks. If your neck looked like that, your head would wobble around like a bobblehead. We need, we need to have your neck look something more, probably something more like this. Curved lines that come in like that. Take a look in the mirror. An important part of Michel the portraits made by Micheline Thomas are the clothing, the beautiful clothes that her models wear. You might tell us what you are wearing. Lots of times here at Art Adventures, I'm wearing an apron. So I'm gonna draw maybe my apron out here on my shoulders. My shoulders are gonna come out here. Then I'm gonna maybe draw some details about what I'm wearing. And this, these details can tell us a bit about the person. My apron, Tells you that I do something messy. I might include some of my buttons or my Jocelyn name tag. So when people look at my portrait, these are clues, some context clues, some clues that tell us a bit about that person in the portrait. So you might tell, you might even draw us in your favorite shirt, or maybe if you have, uh, maybe if you play a sport, maybe in your uniform, or whatever. Uh, maybe if you like to cook it as well, maybe you wear an apron. Now. You, now for hair, this is the fun part for me, I gotta get to use my imagination. You people, and we're gonna, you, you, you people right now probably all look like me, but we need to give yourself some hair. And not just a little bit of hair right up there, or a little bit of hair sticking off the top of your head. Instead, your hair comes down all the way down into your forehead. And then it also sticks up off the top of your head, especially in uh, the hairdo in Micheline, the portrait by Micheline Thomas. We can see that her head probably stops right about here, but her hair keeps on going. Just like your hair. Even if you have less hair than, the, uh, than Din does in that portrait, your hair probably sticks up a little bit. So I'm going to give myself, I'm going to give myself the dream hair to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start my hair way up here. 
right up. I'm going to sketch. I'm sketching in. Maybe I'll sketch with the, my green so you can see. I'll sketch it in here, and then it comes down and the over to your forehead. Put your put your uh, put the, your finger on the on the edge of your hairline. Mine used to be right about there. And you can put your head on the top of your head, and there's some space there. So your hair is going to come all the way down. Draw the shape of your hair. Just draw the shape. Don't worry about drawing in all the little hairs yet. Look at the shape, almost like Lego hair. And maybe your hair peeks out the back. Oh yeah, look at that. That would be nice, wouldn't it? And maybe it comes on over your ears, maybe even to your eye, like, like a heartthrob. Over here, draw the shape of your hair. Whatever hair that you see, I'm sketching this in. And it's good to sketch your hair, remember? We're sketching softly. And then I'll come in with my black crayon and draw in the shape of that hair. And if you have curly hair, you can give your hair some, give it some texture. Draw those curls. If you have fuzzy hair, if you have a short buzz hair to do and it's kind of fuzzy, give yourself, make sure you draw the texture of your hair. Maybe your hair is in braids. Maybe you have, maybe you have a mohawk. Maybe you have some kind of a cool haircut that I don't have that you can draw and show us. And so draw the shape, the shape of your hair. Maybe you have barrettes and things in your hair. And maybe some of you might have glasses, right? Sometimes I wear glasses when they're not on the top of my head. So at the end is a, a good time to come in and maybe if you need to draw your glasses, you can draw glasses or earrings or other details on your portrait. All of these things that make us unique and all of these head accessories, all those head accoutrements that make, that help you express yourself. All right, now our portraits is complete. Before we run out of time, let's talk about how we want to um, add color to our portrait. Now you have watercolor, some of you might have watercolor paints, like these here, and we have all these different colors, but none of these colors probably match our skin tones exactly. So let me give you some tips on how to, to mix colors to create a skin tone that's unique for your model. Some of our skin, our, our skin tones are light, some of our skin tones are dark, some, and everywhere in between. And so let's talk about how we can experiment with our paints to create a skin tone. Now oftentimes I like to start, I like to use, for my, when, I do, when I like skin tones, I like to mix colors that are opposite. Orange and blue are opposite. Red and green are opposite. Uh, and I like to often, I like to start with my warm, my warm color first. So my warm color, or I'm gonna use orange and blue. And orange is, a war is my warm color. I'm gonna load up with lots of orange to begin with. So I put a little bit of water on my paints. I'm using these big watercolor paints so you can see more clearly. Put a little bit of water and then load up with gently Pet that paint with lots and lots, making lots and lots of brush strokes to load, load up with lots of paint. So the entire hairdo of that brush, those bristles are orange. And I'm going to come in and I'll just paint my entire, all my, that skin tone quickly with orange to begin with. Or you might start with red. Some, and this, skin tones take practice out there, gang. Skin tones take practice and experimentation. If I don't, if my, if my skin tones might not be quite right, so I might have to you know, might add more orange or more blue here in a minute. And as I brush, do you know, I'm, I'm kind of imagining my brush guiding over the contours or the shape of my face. So like on the ball of my nose, I might make little round brush strokes. Up my, up my bridge of my nose, maybe a, a, a slightly curved vertical brush stroke. When you come and visit, this is my favorite part of this picture by Michelin Thomas. When you come and visit, you can see, you can look closely and see lots of brush strokes. And those brush strokes kind of move over the body of Den in this portrait. So that she's painted pretty flat, but I can see the, the brush strokes define the shape of her face, the form of her face. And then in the in Michelin Thomas has used different kinds of paint in the hair. So we can see lots of brush strokes in the hair that you, when you come and visit, you can take a close, closer look at all these brush strokes. So as you're painting, think about your brush strokes as lines and think about your brush strokes kind of gliding over the shape or the form of, our, of, my, of my face, my eyebrows over here. I kind of want to go over those 
shapes shape of my face around the eye socket. That's the eye socket. That's like that recess, that low valley where your eye rests. Come there in your eye socket. And my both ears. All everything where I can see the skin. And then I'm going to add some blue. And we're going to, uh, on this portrait, and this is no longer me. It's definitely changed. It does not look like me anymore, does it? So I, I can create any kind of skin tone I want. And I, I'm going to add some blue to make this skin tone a, a bit more dark. And so I'm going to rinse my brush. I put my brush in the cup of water. Gently squish it around. Scrape your hairdo. It's always good to scrape the hairdo before you take your brush out of the cup of water. Scrape the bristles on the side of the cup to get rid of that extra water. And now I'm going to load up with some blue. When I paint with my blue, on top of that, on top of my orange, those two complementary colors are going to mix together to make a brown tone. And all of our skin tones are basically a different, a different tone of brown. Some of them are much more light. Some of them are, are, are more dark and everywhere in between. So I can add some, by using orange and blue, I can make a, a skin tone. If I use lots of orange and just a little bit of blue, we have a more light skin tone. If I use, actually, if we use just a little bit of orange and just a little bit of blue, we have a very light skin tone. If you use lots of orange and a little bit more, and you keep adding a little more bit of blue, we'll get darker and darker. And if we get too, if it, your face starts to look too blue, like a Smurf, you just add some more orange. And we can do the same thing using uh, our complementary colors, red and and uh, and green. Only those colors will be a bit more less warm. So you can decide. All of us have to experiment. So it takes artists have to practice in their studios again and again. So you may not get when you're making your portraits, you may not get the you might you may not find the right skin tone on your first try. But if you keep trying again and again, you might try it, you can get it on your second try. I'm gonna do let's make this I'm gonna make my hair. I'm gonna use red and green before we leave. Let's use red and green. I like to start with my warm color first. Let's start with some red, and I'm gonna paint my hair a different a different kind of brown using red and green. So I'm gonna use lots and lots of red. Paint all that hair red. Maybe you have red hair. What kind of, there's different kinds of red hair though too. You could maybe add some orange, maybe a reddish orange hair. Maybe you have a strawberry red hair. Kind of blondy. To look, when you're making, you're mixing your colors, you might have to add one color, rinse off your brush and paint another color right on top of it. Or these can be imaginary portraits. And you can make these super funky. You can give yourself purple skin and green hair and orange eyeballs. It's up to you. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of green. Paint right on top of my red, and my red and my green will mix together to make a different different tone of brown. Kind of a cooler tone of brown. So you can decide what, when you're making your skin tones, we could use just a little bit of red and a touch of green, or a lot of red and add a little bit more green. And if you get too green, like Frankenstein, you add a little more red. It takes practice. Mixing, mix, for mixing, it always takes practice when we're making art, but mixing skin tones especially takes practice. Now I could keep going. I could add color. I could even add some, I could even find some uh, glue and glitter and add glitter to my lips like Micheline Thomas, but we're running out of time. So let me quickly show you what we'll do next. Once your picture is finished and dry, I encourage you to take your time when you share your pictures with me, when you're, when you're making your art, getting ready to share them on our Facebook page. Take your time, do your best work. Maybe do several portraits and choose your favorite one and, cut, and then we'll cut your portrait out. Let's bring this over. <coughs> My portrait's kind of wet. It'd be, it's easiest to let your portrait relax and dry out. And then we're going to cut, cut, cut. And when we're cutting, you can cut. You don't need to cut right up against your head. Like I see that little hair sticking out here. I'm going to cut around that little hair. and Cut around, cut around. And I'm cutting quickly. You can decide how carefully you want to cut your portrait at home. Cut all that space around because what we'll do next is glue that right on top of your pattern paper or the pattern that you 
Drew. Micheline Thomas, she'll often project. She'll, she'll work, she'll have her models sit in her studio and she'll draw and paint them and take photographs of them and then create a drawing again and again of, create lots of drawings and sketches of her subjects. And then choose a drawing that she likes best and project. It's like a movie projection is projected onto a movie screen. She'll project her image, her portraits really big onto a huge surface, maybe a canvas or a huge board, and draw them again. It's tracing over those lines from her small drawing, projected onto the big painting before she paints her big giant canvases, just like the one that you'll see when you come to the museum. So once you have your picture cut out, you'll simply, what you'll do is take that big giant picture, take your glue stick, take your glue stick, and I, and my advice on glue sticks, for especially big portraits like this, is to take your glue stick and go all the way around the edge. Can you see that? Go all the way around the edge. You can do it quickly. All the way around the edge. Mine's bigger than yours. All the way around the edge. And then maybe one X, two big X's. Two big X's. We don't ever we never need to cover the whole thing. Now we have lots of glue to use for other things later on. So two big X's and all the way around the edge of my portrait. And that's gonna be just the right size to look how that covers up almost all of that pattern from before. So I know that the person in this portrait is the most important thing. That person looks confident and powerful as they gaze right back at you. I can't wait to see your portraits. I can't wait to see self-portraits, the pictures you painted of yourself. Or I can't wait to see who you chose as a model. Maybe a, a, a little brother or a sister, or maybe an adult at home. Thanks for making art with me. Don't forget to share your finished artworks by posting them, posting pictures of your, of your portraits to our Facebook event page for today's art adventure. And follow us on Facebook for updates about all of Jocelyn's Art From Afar experiences, including virtual art camps, which are happening right now all through summer, Monday through Friday in the morning and the afternoon for ages 6 to 12. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for making art with me. And we'll see you next week. Adios. Adios, artists.